Formula One is fun again. After looking like the 2024 season was just going to be an elongation of the 2023 season, we finally have some battling for first place. A big part of that is down to the simple fact that Red Bull have hit a problem and McLaren have improved. Let's get into how this season has led to Max Verstappen and Lando Norris finally colliding in Austria by looking at the fall of Red Bull, the rise of McLaren, and how the rest of the season is set up to be an all-time classic. I think we were all a little bit worried at the start of the 2024 season because it wasn't looking very competitive. Max Verstappen was continuing his dominance from 2023, winning four of the first five races. The gap to the next nearest non-Red Bull in those races was 22 seconds in Bahrain, 18.6 seconds in Saudi Arabia, 20.8 seconds in Japan, and 13.7 seconds in China. And that loss in Australia only came because of a technical fault, rather than Max Verstappen being off the pace or other teams actually being able to match him. Carlos Sainz even said himself he was pretty lucky to win that race. Even beyond that in Miami, the safety car played a big part in him only finishing in second, whilst in Imola, he returned to the top step of the podium. It looked like we were on for another season where the Dutch national anthem was the only song Formula One would need for their podium ceremonies. However, the upgrades to the cars throughout Monaco, Canada and Spain have revealed the true pace of the other teams and set up the rest of the season to be incredibly competitive. In the last six Grand Prix, we've seen four different Grand Prix winners from four different manufacturers. Yes, Max Verstappen has won three of those six, but the key here is those victories haven't come as easily as they did last year. Lando, Charles and George were all worthy Grand Prix winners in my opinion, considering where the pace of their cars has been over the last few races and the performances that those drivers have been putting in, it all goes to show that Red Bull isn't going to be able to walk comfortably to victories anymore and any mistakes that they make will no longer go unpunished. The races in Imola, Monaco and Spain particularly always see the teams across Formula 1 bring their first significant upgrade packages for the season. Everyone has had five or six races to see where they sit amongst the field, see what their new car for the season is like, and produce parts that they think will help improve things. Then they can easily transport those to the European races due to most of the Formula One factories being based somewhere in Europe. And even though they were winning races, Red Bull were no exception to this, bringing significant upgrades to their car in Spain to try and increase the gap that they had over the other teams in the Drivers' and Constructors' Championships. In fact, after a tricky race weekend in Imola, where the Red Bull of Max Verstappen found itself off the track three times during Free Practice 1 due to the front end of the Red Bull car being very unstable, and of course having that photo finish with Lando Norris, followed by similar issues with understanding the car on another bumpy circuit in Monaco, which saw Verstappen's worst race finish of the season so far, highlighting that when the car changes its ride height, it really suffers more than expected. Max Verstappen actually went back to Imola and completed a test run driving the 2022 RB18 so that he could instruct the team on where the strengths and weaknesses of each car's lie, in the hopes that the team would be able to readjust this year's car and find more performance, which does make it feel like Red Bull have come to to a point where their performance gains are starting to plateau, which does happen as you get deeper into a regulation cycle, there has to be a ceiling somewhere, but in Formula 1 when you don't improve, it gives others the opportunity to catch up or even overtake you. Which leads us to their now closest competitor McLaren, whose first major upgrade of the season actually came a little earlier than expected in Miami. The team seems to finally have a clear understanding of their package and a development path that is working, which I think comes from the technical acquisitions and structures that they put in place last season, having that time to come to the fore and show the steps that that has allowed them to take. Just to give one example, the recent changes that we've seen to their front wing. They have a clear grip and understanding of what affects them in low speed versus high speed corners. And then they implemented a change which addresses an issue and makes them quicker, which is something that all the teams are trying to achieve, but not many of them do it that seamlessly. Of course, for Red Bull, it's a little bit more difficult to make those gains because they're just trying to stay at the top of the tree. And if the car is already towards the top end of the best that it can be, then there's not really much more pace to find, but the McLaren team's ability to keep finding time and address known issues has been amazing to watch. All of that has allowed them to, I think, take the mantle as the fastest race car on the grid. And I do think there's a distinction there because although I do think the Red Bull car still has the general advantage through the spectrum of low, medium and high speed corners that we see on the Formula One calendar, it's probably still the best overall car. 
The McLaren car, particularly in the hands of Lando Norris, seems to have better tyre life, and especially towards the end of a stint, has a clear pace advantage. Just look at the last few laps in Imola, or the last stint in Austria, for example. And Lando knows this. Just listen to the radio messages in Spain, where the team asks him if he wants to cover George, and Lando has the confidence in the car to say, we don't need to cover George, we can go after Max. Last year, I don't think we'd have seen that. McLaren would have seen Mercedes as their competitor in the race and pitted to cover off George Russell and just settle for second place behind Verstappen. But this year they have enough faith in the car to leave out another few laps and enough belief that they can catch the Red Bull team to really go for it and trust Lando that even though he's going to lose track position, he'll be able to beat the Mercedes anyway with the tyre advantage in the final stint. And whenever the McLaren car was in clean air, it was able to gain on Verstappen at the front and probably was the quickest car in Spain, even though it didn't finish first. In the end, I think they left Lando out just a little bit too long, actually, and left him too much to do, having to get past the Ferraris and the Mercedes in Spain before he could have a go at Max Verstappen. But that's the experience that the team needs to gain, because they haven't been in those kinds of battles in recent history. It's that experience at the front and the talent of Max Verstappen, which was the difference maker in Spain for Red Bull, with both of their stops being timed perfectly and executed well, putting Max Verstappen out into clean air and actually gaining him nearly three seconds on Lando Norris because the McLaren pit stops were just slower. Then if I tell you that Lando finished two seconds behind Max in Spain and lost three seconds in the stops, you can see that the only difference between the two on the day was Red Bull's experience of being in race winning scenarios and judging those pit stops and strategy calls better. Which is why I was so shocked to see what happened in Austria, because as much as the collision between cars is Max Verstappen's fault, everything leading up to the incident was caused by Red Bull being very un-Red Bull-like. First of all, before the race even started, they had one less set of new medium tyres for Max compared to what Lando had, on a track where the medium tyre was clearly the fastest race tyre. Red Bull would usually be comfortable enough in their pace to hold back a set like McLaren did, but they had to use it throughout the rest of the weekend. Second was the bad pit stop timings. Max made it very clear that coming out into traffic after both of his pit stops caused him to not only lose time, but also struggle to get his tyres into the window that he had hoped for, particularly after the first stop when he had both Haas cars bearing down on him and actually looking quicker than Max, forcing him to push the tyres harder than he wanted to at that point in the Grand Prix. Which really happened because of the third aspect that we need to talk about, and possibly the most un-Red Bull-like thing, their slow pit stops. For a team that has been lauded as the best team in the pit lane for as long as I can remember, and even earlier in this video I explained how in Spain they executed the stops perfectly, it was a very off day in Austria. The first stop was slow and had us debating if Max was going to get an unsafe release penalty, but the second was even worse, and that's what let Lando Norris within touching distance. The rear left tyre was slow to go onto the car, which meant Verstappen couldn't be released in front of Norris, so he had to wait for him to pass by in the pit lane, meaning Max was stationary for 3.6 seconds longer than Lando Norris. That put Norris within overtaking distance way earlier than we expected, and had the pit stop been clean, we'd have likely seen an end to the race more like Imola, where Lando Norris would have maybe attacked on the last few laps. And actually, we saw the first few overtaking attempts from Norris were dealt with quite well by Max. There was some tough racing, but he was able to hold on to the lead for a good 10 laps with Lando Norris right behind him, which would have been on the edge of being enough to win the Grand Prix, depending on how quickly the McLaren would have been able to close that seven second gap to the car in front. Instead, the stop was slow, the gap became three seconds, and Max even locked up his tires trying to lap Valtteri Bottas because he was under pressure, and that meant Lando Norris was right up behind him almost straight away meaning Max Verstappen needed to try and keep the faster McLaren on better tyres behind him for almost 20 laps, which even for any of the best defensive drivers in Formula 1 history is almost an impossible achievement. Which then leads us to lap 64, and the tension had been building from lap 52 up to that point, with Lando trying a few different methods of overtaking, and at turn 3 he goes for one more of those moves, and Verstappen cuts across the front of the McLaren, doesn't leave a car's width on the outside of the track, and the two collide. I think everyone can see that Verstappen is at fault for the coming together and rightfully got a penalty for it, but I do agree with Verstappen in that the Red Bull team are more to blame for the overall race going wrong for them. Of course, that doesn't justify him hitting into an opponent, but I can see where he's coming from. Then obviously from McLaren's side of things, Norris is rightfully frustrated, but 
taking the positives, McLaren were quicker, and if McLaren can hang around the front long enough, they will force Red Bull into more errors. They will improve their understanding of how to win races themselves, and I think it's guaranteed that they'll pick up more race wins this season. Which then makes me wonder, what are we going to see for the rest of this season? Will Max Verstappen lose more Grand Prix than last year? Well, yes, he already has. But are we going to see Red Bull fall off completely? Absolutely not. As we've seen, it's one thing having an equal or even faster car than Max Verstappen. It's another thing beating him in the race. Despite the Red Bull looking like it's within touching distance of the other top teams, Max has still stood on the top step of the podium for seven of the 11 races so far. And even when he doesn't win, he's right up there. So I can't see a championship battle developing in the driver's standings. However, I can see Red Bull and McLaren continuing to battle out on track for wins with both Mercedes and Ferrari coming into the mix at the top as the season progresses. Mercedes have massively impressed. And although the win from George Russell in Austria wasn't due to the Mercedes being the quickest car, performances like Canada, where he was right with the Red Bull of Max Verstappen and the McLaren of Lando Norris on merit, as well as Hamilton getting back onto the podium places in Spain, means that the third time really has been the charm for Mercedes. It feels like they're on the cusp of being able to make that jump, and I think we might actually see them win a race on race pace very soon. They're bringing little upgrades to each race because, let's not forget, they still have a lot to learn and a lot of gains to be made because this concept that they have is still very early on in its development with them. However, the smaller steps towards an overall faster car are starting to add up and put them in the fight for the podium places a lot more often. Whereas Ferrari, despite starting the season as Red Bull's nearest challenger, does seem to have stalled a little bit after Charles Leclerc managed to finally break the Monaco curse. In the last few races, they've been slower than the Mercedes car in terms of race pace, and although the margins are still minuscule between the teams, the Ferrari has been underwhelming in the last few weekends. I mean, they had an absolute nightmare weekend in Canada due to their execution of well, everything, and it wasn't much better in Spain or Austria. However, Ferrari have gone through a few of these cycles since the regulation change in 2022 and do seem to come back into contention towards the summer break. They fast-tracked an upgrade onto the car for Spain, which hasn't quite clicked yet, but they have improved relative to themselves last season, so I have faith that they will find form at some point again this year. So the rest of the season is set up to have some of the most fun races that we've had since before the turbo hybrid engines were introduced in 2014. Four teams all in the position to, if they get it right, be battling for victories and competing for the podium places. We still have 13 races left to go. If you're excited to see the rest of the 2024 season, make sure you subscribe to the channel as I'm live for every single race weekend. And if you want a more detailed breakdown of everything that went down in Austria, click this link here and I'll see you over there.